Hi everyone, uh, so I just got a new document camera here, you can see this right here, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you guys through this uh, test, you can't really see it very well right now, but wait just a minute. All right, so here it is, folks. This is uh, the view that you're gonna get now, which uh, is quite nice compared to me just holding it up. Uh, so I'm gonna take you through test four, and uh, you're gonna have a lot of uh, um, choice here in terms of what you wanna watch, if you wanna fast forward through some stuff, or if you wanna pause and try the question yourself before moving on, or if you wanna rewind and watch it again and again and again. Uh, so um, I hope you guys uh, make use of this video and enjoy it. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through outcome R3. Uh, we're going to look at quadratic functions in vertex form and uh, let's get started. Okay, so the first question here asks you to go through uh, this parabola. So you've got a quadratic y equals 3x minus 2 squared minus four. So if you remember from class, we had y equals a x minus p squared minus four. And the vertex for this would be p comma q. Sorry, here I should have had a q there. Uh, so we've got a q. Now our p value, that's the x value of our vertex. And this is now a point, right? So if we're looking at this here, our x value is gonna be two, and our y value is going to be that negative four. So our vertex, now this is a coordinate point here, so please make sure you have these brackets, or else it's just two numbers floating around in space with a comma in the middle. Doesn't really look very nice, doesn't make much sense, okay? So those brackets are very important. Now, our a value, which is our three, is positive. So we've got a positive three here. So this means that our direction of opening is up. So it's an upwards or U-shaped. All right, the equation of our axis of symmetry, uh, that's our fold line. So where we can take the parabola, fold it in half, and it's gonna be exactly symmetrical on both sides. So that's where we have our X value of our vertex, so right here we've got x equals two. And please make sure you write x equals two because it is an equation, okay? And that's this line right here when we run up and down. So I'm gonna put a dotted line right here and I'm gonna actually label it x equals two. So please make sure you have a dotted line and let's just kind of go past the graph a little bit just to make it nice. Uh, while we're here, why don't we plot our vertex as well? So I've got our x equals uh, 2 and y equals negative 4 so I'm gonna go right down to here and you notice right here folks how it says label three points clearly on the graph that means right here I'm gonna label this point and I'm gonna say that that point is 2 comma negative 4 that's my vertex all right uh, our minimum, so our minimum or maximum? Well, this one doesn't have a maximum. Our maximum's technically gonna be infinity because the parabola just kind of goes up and up and up forever and ever. So there's no max, it just goes on to infinity. Our minimum is the lowest point of our graph. So this vertex is gonna be our lowest point on the graph. So it's gonna have kind of like this, this type of, of shape right here. Um, now our minimum is our y value of the vertex, so that is at negative uh, four. So when y is negative four, that's our minimum. So the point, uh, so we can just say y equals negative four right there. Now our y intercept, that is where our parabola crosses through this y axis. Now, if you notice what the value of x is right here, that's gonna be zero. So you can set x equals zero and then solve for your y. So I'm gonna do that right here, y equals. Now make sure when you're doing this, you take care of order of operations, okay? And don't just guess. So we've got three times four minus four, that's 12 minus four and that gives us eight. So the y-intercept is gonna happen at zero comma eight. 
let's plot that point right now. That's over here. And hey, that's another point. So let's label it. Put two brackets around it and a comma in between both of the numbers. 0, 8. All right. Now, uh, I can get my third point here by hardly even uh, working for it. So I noticed that uh, I'm two away from my axis of symmetry. So why don't I just stay along the same y value and go two along the other side. And then that's going to give me my third point that I require. And that lands me at four comma eight. Okay, so now I've got three points and I can, oh, I got a little happy face here. He, okay, so now I can connect these and uh, draw my parabola. Put arrowheads on the end. Make sure you've got a nice curve down here. Uh, and there she be, five out of five, okay? Now, this question here, describe in words and justify. So you want to use some words and you want to justify four defining characteristics of this quadratic function. Okay, so first off, I'm going to notice here that this a value, so my a value is positive okay so that means that the because my a value is positive that means that it my parabola is going to be opening upwards okay so it's going to be a u shape uh, all right so my a value let's keep talking about our a value our a value is um, it's one third so that means that uh, it's between 1 and negative 1 uh, and that means that my uh, parabola is going to be wider than my x squared parabola okay uh, we've got here let's see we can talk about the vertex so the vertex for this is going to be uh, negative 2 comma negative 7 and that's because of our uh, original form so we've got y that's we get that from here minus p squared minus q where p and q are our vertex uh, let's see we've got our um, we're going to have a minimum because it opens, oh, I should write because, not therefore, because it opens up. So our minimum is going to be, uh, min is when y is negative 7. Uh, so there's an example of four defining characteristics. Uh, you want to tell me what the reason for why you know this, basically. That's what we're looking for. All right, so let's move on to number three. Okay, so for the graph below, state the range, the domain, and the vertex. Okay, so here we have uh, no equation. We've just given you a graph. And the first thing that I notice right away actually is this answer right here. This is my vertex. So just be careful when you're looking down. Uh, sometimes if you don't follow the line nicely, you might misread the coordinate point. So right there, that's negative 4. So my vertex is negative 4 and my y value is 10. Okay, so I'm going to write the answer for my vertex first to make sure you have your brackets and your comma keep everything nicely or else your numbers are just floating around in mid space uh, now the domain the domain is actually pretty easy for all of these it's the same for parabolas you notice how this kind of keeps going that way this keeps going that way so you can actually put in any value of x any value of x you're going to be able to read a y value uh, so no matter how big you get on the sides here you'll always be seeing a value of x uh, so that makes uh, the domain uh, x such that x is always an element of the real number system, okay? So that just means that any value, any x value that's real goes in and we'll get, a, we'll get an answer. 
Uh, now for our range, um, uh, that's going to be our y values that we're caring about. Now, you notice how this parabola stops right here and it never actually goes beyond up into this area. So we're looking at this point right here. So that's where our y is uh, 10. So do we have values above 10? No, the graph never goes there, right? So our range is going to be y is less than or equal to 10. So y values less than or equal to 10. Um, I'm never going to be able to get a number. There's no x value that I can put into this graph and read off a value of uh, y that's going to be bigger than 10. Okay, so there's your range, your domain, and your vertex. Now the second part of the question here says determine the equation that describes the quadratic function in vertex form. So we know this general form right here, x minus p squared plus q, uh, and this p and q stands for the vertex, right? So we know our vertex is negative 4, 10, so we've got that there. So let's just plop that in, x so notice here, I'm going to have a plus 4 because I've got a negative 4 as my p-value. So you got negative, negative, which turns it into positive. Plus, oh, wait, instead of this q, I should have written 10. Okay, so now here I've got an equation except for the fact that I need this a-value. I don't have a number for a. That's really important. I need to figure that out. That's what this whole question is about, is can you figure out what that a value is? Uh, what do you have in your tool bag that you can uh, find me what that a is? Now, notice here I've actually labeled a point so that we can all read uh, nicely on a graph what point lies on the line. Technically, you can use any point on this parabola, but sometimes it's hard to read an exact point. So I, I made sure that the program plotted a point for us and gave us the coordinate that actually does lie on. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use 0, 6 from the graph. Okay, and I'm going to see, notice how that's an x value, that's a y value. I'm going to substitute uh, a 0 here for the x and a 6 for the y. So a little nicely, if I write it out, I get 6 equals a, and that's what I'm looking for, so that's good. Plus 4 squared plus 10. Um, and then all I want to do is I want to solve for my a. So I've got 6 equals a. Let's just square the 4, so then that becomes 16 plus 10. Okay, so now from here, I'm going to solve for, okay, solve for a. So let me just rewrite that up here. 6 equals a times 16 plus 10. Subtract 10 on both sides. That gives me negative 4 over here. a times 16 divided both sides by 16. And that gives me negative 4 over 16. Reduce that fraction and we end up with negative 1 over 4 as our a value. Okay, uh, now I need room to actually write the question, write my final answer down. So I've run out of a little bit of room. Uh, let's do, let's see. Hmm. Okay, so let's just kind of write it on the side here. Sorry if I'm making you dizzy. I'm going to pick a new color just so that we can have it nicely written over here. And okay, you know what, I'm going to flip it over. So take this, uh, what you have here, and basically I'm going to replace, keep my y and my x as y and x. So I've got y equals, I'm going to use the value of a that I found right here and I'm going to replace it right here in my a. So I've got x plus 4 squared and then uh, plus 10. So this is the final answer that we're looking for and that's the final answer to the question here. So that's the equation that describes the function in vertex form. 
uh, right here. You gotta have all of the elements. Make sure you plot back your Y and your X so that it works for every uh, point that you plug in there. Okay. Okay, now convert this function, number four, convert this to standard form. Basically, this is an exercise in expanding, follow your, following your order of operations. So let's uh, go take it from here and see how it goes. So I've got y equals one third x plus two squared minus seven. Well, this x plus two squared business, this just means one over three x plus two, x plus two minus seven. So I'm gonna multiply this out first and I've got one over three x, put your bracket there, x squared plus four x plus four minus seven. And then I'm gonna run my one third through to each guy, okay? So I've got one third x squared plus four over three x plus four over three minus seven. Okay, so I'm almost there, right? The only thing I need to do is I need to simplify this part here because those are uh, like terms. So my final answer is going to be, here I'll just write it over here, y equals one third x squared plus four over three X okay, minus okay, 17 over 3. Okay. okay. All right. So hey, let's look at bouncer. the next question. Okay. Right here. This is completing the square uh, so that we can get to vertex form. All right. Uh, our first question here is uh, y equals 2x squared plus 6x plus 7. And we're going to start with um, just rewriting it and spacing it out nicely so that we can set up for our completion of the square. Uh, okay. Now, um, it's uh, a good idea to factor out this negative two here, factor it out of this part, this first part that we've bracketed off. So we're gonna get negative two, and then what's left inside is x squared minus three x, and I'm just gonna leave the space there for effect and uh, have a plus seven. Okay, now, so in here, what we wanna do is we want to complete the square. So we want to create a perfect square trinomial in here that we can write into the uh, x minus p squared form. Okay, so the way we do that is we look at our three right here and uh, I want to divide it by two and square it. Okay, so it's going to be 3 over 2, and then we're going to square it. So 3 squared is 9, 2 squared is 4. So to complete this square here, we have plus 9 over 4. Now, every time if I, I've added a new term, right? So I need to balance my equation by subtracting the exact same value of that term. Now you have to note that the actual value of this here is not just nine over four, but in fact, because we've got this negative two out here, it's negative two times nine over four, okay? So we've got negative two times nine over four. So the actual value of that is negative nine over two. So this is what I really added on there. Okay. All right, so now that I've noticed that the actual value of what I added on here was nine over four times two, so it's negative nine over two, that's what I added on. So I can only add zeros, right, and not change the value of things. So I need to make sure that I 
add a 9 over 2. Because this is negative 9 over 2 that I've added, I need to add a positive 9 over 2. Okay. So now that allows me to go on to my next line. I've got negative 2. And right here, I can factor this. If I were to factor this, I would end up with x minus 3 over 2, x minus 3 over 2, uh, plus, and then, you know, combine these two. That's 23 over 2. All right, so I can rewrite this as y equals. Please make sure you have your y equals. x minus 3 over 2, all squared plus 23 over 2, okay? So this would be your final completed the square for that question. Okay, and our uh, other question here has the negative 1 half x squared minus 6x plus 4. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go y equals negative 1 half x squared minus 6x have my brackets, space it off, and put my 4 out there. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out my negative 1 half out of these first two terms. I end up with x squared, and then notice this here, right here, plus 12x, all right? You want to make sure that when you go back, when you multiply this back through, you end up at your original. So if I multiply this here, negative one-half times x squared, I end up with negative one-half x squared. If I multiply negative one-half by 12x, I end up with negative 6x. So just be careful about this. Make sure you're thinking about how fractions work and things like that for that part right there. So now I've got to complete my square. So I'm going to add on uh, let's see right here. I've got my 12 divided by 2 all squared. That's 6 squared. So I'm going to add on a 36 here to complete that perfect square. And notice again right here, what's the actual value that I've added on? Well, it's this, right? So I've actually added on a negative 18. So to balance it, what I need to do is I need to add a positive 18 right here, okay? All right, now going to my next step, I've got y equals negative 1 half x squared plus 12x plus 36 plus right here, that's 22. And then I can factor this trinomial and I end up with x plus 6 squared plus 22. And there she be. That's your converted into uh, vertex form from standard form. All right. Okay. Uh, now, number, well, our numberings kind of jump all over the place. I find that funny. Uh, okay, so now we've got number five. Uh, we're still in R3. No, sorry, we're still in R4. And we are going to fill in and sketch the graph of, notice how we've given this in standard form. Uh, so you have to have some tools in your belt to figure what uh, what is what. Okay, now uh, we've got to figure out the vertex. Remember that cheap and easy way to figure out the x value of the vertex? Well, that's x equals minus b over 2a, right? So what is your b value? Well, your b value is actually negative 4 divided by 2 times, what's your a value? 2. Okay, so that actually gets us a plus 1. So that's our, y, our x value of our vertex. And then to get our y value of the vertex, well, you just take this plus 1 that you figured out and you put it into here. So 2 times 1 squared minus 4 times 1 squared, sorry, 4 times 1 plus 1. Uh, so then that gives us uh, 2 minus 4 plus 1. Okay, well, uh, a little bit of mental math, hopefully, and that's negative 1. 
Uh, okay, so now let's plop our vertex right away so we don't forget to do it. So 1 and negative 1. So that's right there. Please label 1, comma, negative 1. Put brackets around things so that you make sure they don't fly away. And our range. Okay, well, um, before I do my range, actually, we can do our range right now because we know that this value here is positive, so I know it's opening upward, which means that this is going to be my minimum, right? So my y, my range, is going to be y is greater than or equal to negative 1. And then for my y-intercept, my y-intercept just set x equal to 0 and see what happens. Well, hopefully you can just look at this and notice that if you plug a 0 here, this becomes 0. Plug a 0 here in x, this becomes a 0, and we're left with 1. So your y-intercept is going to happen right at 0, 1. Let's plot that point, 0, 1. Let's label it. Put your brackets around, make it look nice. Now I can get my third point right here using the axis of symmetry. So I'm one over from the vertex, go one the other direction, and label your point at 2, comma 1. So there are your three nicely labeled points, and uh, draw in your parabola, have a nice curve right there, and that's it, 5 out of 5, okay? Here is our word problem. So we've got a rectangular field beside a river. This is the river. It's, uh, you don't need to be, you don't need to fence this area here uh, by the river, okay? You only need to fence this here, this here, and right along here. So you're going to be using 160 meters of fencing to fence those three sides. So that's going to be our perimeter. So our perimeter is going to be made up of, let's call that the width, let's call that the length, uh, 2w plus l. So that's our two widths and our length. And there's a number associated to that. That's going to be 160 meters. So we've got 160 meters. Um, now to maximize the area, so we want to maximize the area here, right? The greatest area. Uh, area is length times width, right? So now we've got these two equations here, and we want one quadratic, we want one equation that's going to express the maximum area that we can have. That's going to look like a quadratic, and we've got the word maximum here, right? So greatest maximum. So we know that the parabola is going to have to look probably like that. It's going to be an upside down U shape. And we're going to get our answer right here. Okay. Uh, so we need to figure out a quadratic. And we know, we should know, that our A value is going to be negative because it's an upside down U shape or a rainbow shape. Okay, so I'm going to combine this and this together. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rewrite this formula. I'm going to rewrite that equation, and it's going to, I'm going to solve it for L. So I'm going to say L equals 160 minus 2W, and I'm going to use L times W. That was our A. That's our maximum area. I'm going to substitute this part in here for this L and I'm going to come up with a quadratic right now. So 160 minus 2W times W, multiply that through, I get my quadratic 160W minus 2W squared. Now I can rewrite that so that it's my squared term first and then it's my B term and then my C term is actually zero here. So this is my quadratic that expresses where I'm going to get my maximum. So notice here that's my maximum, that's also my vertex, right? So we need to figure out what the x value of that is, so I'm going to do it the cheap and easy way. Uh, x equals negative b over 2a. So my b value is 160 and 2 times negative 2, that gives me uh, 40 okay so the what I've actually found here is W I, I could call this W instead of X 
So that's my width. So my width is, is 40. And if I use 40 here, and I use 40 here for my width, what's left over? So I've used 80 of that 160, and then I'm left with 80 there. So my length is 80. Now, the dimensions is going to be 40 by 80 meters for my greatest area. Now, my greatest area is actually going to be 40 times 80 meters squared, okay? And that's 3,200 meters squared is the greatest area. Okay, so, but this is what the question's actually looking for right there. All right. Okay. So now we're going to move on to T3. So T3, that's our sine and cosine law and all that kind of fun stuff. All right, so right here. Uh, determine the measure of x to the nearest tenth of a degree. Okay, so right here, first thing you want to notice is what you're actually given in the triangle, okay? So you're given three sides, so you've given this side, this side, and this side, and you're asked to find an angle. All right, we know that uh, cosine law uh, deals with three different sides and an angle. So we've got our formula a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos of a. So let's call this angle a, angle b, angle c, and then everything just kind of flows from there. So we've got our b and our a. Okay, uh, so let's substitute our numbers in. So I've got 16 squared equals 20 squared plus 27 squared minus 2 times 20, 27 cos of A. And this is what I'm hoping to solve for is my cos A so I can uh, find my angle A. All right, so now just make sure you're real careful with the arithmetic at this point. Make sure you're following order of operations. So you've got 256. I'm going to just square everything and move it over at the same time just to save a little bit of time and that should all equal cos a so now i've got cos of a equals 873 over 1080 uh, then you want to do your inverse uh, so your angle a equals Cos inverse of 873, 1080. Plunk that into your calculator all at the same time so you don't have any rounding errors. Uh, just so you know, it should be, make sure you're in degree mode, okay? Uh, this. And I never, I never figure out that number and then type that number back into my calculator because I'm gonna end up with a bit of a funny number if I do that. So. If I just use my answer function in my calculator, I can get that it's 36.1 degrees. All right, so nearest tenth of a degree means one decimal place like that. Okay, uh, so this question here says if your angle Q is 40 degrees, your R is 50 degrees, and P is 23 centimeters, what is the angle, uh, sorry, what is the length of Q? So we're trying to solve for this. Um, so a bit of an issue uh, because what I'm given here isn't quite fitting my sine law that I normally have, right? So I actually need to go out and figure that this P angle is 90 degrees. Uh, so now I could actually use sine law or if you notice that this is uh, turns into a simple trig question from grade 10, then great, you can just use, uh, you can just notice that this is the question. It turns into a very simple uh, question like that, right? So you got sine of 40 degrees equals x over 23 and x equals 14.8 centimeters. So that was kind of a little, if you noticed that, then hey, great, kudos to you. Uh, if you didn't notice that, then you would have gone 
and done something like this. So we've got Q over sine of 40 degrees equals 23 over sine of 90 degrees and then you've got Q equals 23 times sine of 40 degrees over sine of 90 degrees which is really just one so 23 times sine 40 degrees and Q equals 14.8 centimeters uh, to the nearest centimeters if you were to round then we'd have 15 centimeters as our answer all right okay now the next question is our ambiguous case question okay so here we go now uh, when we talked about ambiguous case questions we always mentioned how it was a uh, angle side side so you're given an angle here okay uh, you're given and you're given two sides here okay now you have to look at this question you might you might have to actually flip this around this way to notice that what's gonna happen is this line this arm right here this is the arm that's going to swing so this is going to swing this way or that way to see whether it can fit nicely this value is going to change according to that it's new all right uh, so let's uh, do this and figure out our first case. So our first case here is sine of C, 49, 49 over 49, sorry, and sine of 25.3 um, over 33, that's my side B and sine of C, so I'm looking for this angle now in the first case, and that's 49 sine of 25.3 over 33, whoops, um, equals 0 0.63456, and I get angle C equals 39.4 degrees. Okay, so then I can figure out angle A. So angle A is 180 minus 25.3 minus 39.4, and that's 115.3, and that's my angle A, whoops. So that's important, that's important, and then for my side A. So side A, I'm gonna do A over sine of 115.3, that's 33 over sine of 25.33 and then I that leads me to a equals 69.8 centimeters okay so that's case one that's my first triangle now uh, my second triangle is going to be um, angle C so I'm gonna figure out my angle C for the second case and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract 180 from the first C that I found here okay so that's gonna give me that other case so I've got 140 degrees point six that's angle C uh, then figure out my A 180 minus 140.6 minus 25.3 and that gives me 14.1 degrees that's angle A then my second case for side A is A over sine of 14.1 33 sine of 25.3 and that leads me to a equals 
sine of 14.1, 33 over sine of 25.3, uh, which is 18.8 centimeters, okay? So from here, what I have is I've got two cases. Um, I can go back and just kind of quickly sketch what the first one's going to be. Actually, I'm just going to use what that is, this diagram here. So uh, that tells me that this is going to be 39.4, and this angle is going to be 115.3. So you can see it's totally not to scale right now, hey? And that's 69.8. So um, what I would suggest to you is to take what this should be, sketch a little more accurate diagram of what it's going to look like, and then notice how case two is going to look here and uh, hopefully you'll see that question a little better. All right, so our very last question of the test was um, it was, now if I flip this over it's going to look awful because I've written all over the other side. Actually that's not too bad. Okay, so uh, it said here, do not solve this. What I wanted you to do was just draw the diagram for this situation and determine which law you would use to solve it. So uh, my drawing is awful. So here's a helicopter. Um, okay, I don't even know where to start to draw a helicopter. Okay, here, let's see, something like that. Um, and then make it kind of look big okay really I don't know what this looks like it's supposed to be a helicopter okay I'm gonna write helicopter okay so you're flying in a helicopter and this is you looking north so this is you're looking in the north direction and this is you looking in the south okay so you're flying a helicopter and you spot a water tower that's 7.4 kilometers to the north now, if you're flying in the helicopter, the ground is going to be down here, right? This is the ground. Okay, we could draw some nice little grass here. This is the ground. Maybe there's like, you know, a lake down here or something. This could be a lake. There could be like some birds sitting in here. We'll call them bluebirds, geese, or I don't know, ducks. There's ducks and geese all over the place right now. Um, you spot a water tower. Where is the water tower? Is it flying up here in the air? No, the water tower is down here on the ground. So this is your water tower, okay? Water tower. Now we don't have very many water towers in Winnipeg, uh, but let's just, I don't know, call this uh, the FRC water tower, okay? Uh, and then, so it says that it's 7.4 kilometers to the north. So let's say that, so then this is the 7.4 kilometers towards the north. Now in the south at the same time, you see a monument. So you see a monument. A monument is like a statue or something, right? So let's say we've got this monument of some person, I don't know, what or uh, it could be that monument of uh, that thing that's in front of 7-eleven you know that 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 thing right there whatever that is I don't understand what that really is but it's just some type of structure that that you see so here you see this and it's 8.5 kilometers to the south because now you're looking in the south direction right uh, so that's 8.5 kilometers to the south now, the two monuments, the two things that we're looking at, this tower and the monument here, they are separated by a distance of 11.4 kilometers. So from here to here, that is 11.4 kilometers along the flat of the ground. And the question asks, what is the angle at the helicopter? So that's that angle right there. So we need to figure out that. So we can clearly see that we've got three different sides given. This is going to be our cosine law. 
All right. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope that it helps. Uh, I hope it uh, clarifies some things and answers some of your questions. Uh, rewind, pause, rewatch, uh, ask questions, okay? Just make sure you go through this stuff and uh, I hope this was 